2. Psalm 67, God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, Selah, that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among the nations. I am convinced that the importance of a health message is now. Amen. I don't want to enter into any argument specifically weighing up the cons and the pros of the mandates and things, but the experience of science, the very foundations of science that I've been learning them, seems to be coming out at the seams. In other words, there is a true science and there's a false science and there's a true health and there's a false health that comes out of these various streams. Yeah? The, the book that has really helped me quite a bit in this understanding is a book by Jim Henderson called The Whisper of the Serpent, where it shows, like we were talking this morning, about the influence of Greek thought upon education and upon life in general. If we do not realize that the, that the implications or the, the influence of Greek thought has influenced science itself, then we need to reconsider that because there are two streams that flow out through history looking at true science based on empirical, that's testable, that's based on God's natural laws which are testable and reproducible and there's another, there's another uh, issue, there's another, another flow of science that Jim Henderson points to and he calls it rationalistic. It differs quite considerably, the two differ quite considerably and from this rationalistic science flows out a rationalistic health that is not the same as God's health and his laws. In that context, the, 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 the experience with COVID has been quite significant for me in that as a nurse, I've been having to address how, how I would approach when I got uh, the coronavirus with the symptoms of it. It happened this past summer and having been a, a student of the health message for quite a while, I was led to, when the, when the coronavirus began, or yeah, the coronavirus began, the Lord focused me on making sure that I was living in conformity with the eight national laws. And I was doing good. Um, there was a time when I was looking at the news and they were saying, look out for, 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 for COVID toes. And so when I was taking care of my patient, I was like, it'll show, show up in certain, you know, in, in certain ways. And so there was a time when I, when I became quite fearful you know, in, in whatever I was listening to as far as the news goes. But when it, when it came down to me actually getting COVID, the Lord said, uh, I, I was impressed. Why did you get it? In other words, the, 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 there should be something, Ricky, that 
you haven't been, you were consistent for a while, and then you dropped off something, and now you have this. I was taught to reason in my journey from cause to effect. And wonder of wonders, the Lord says, you know what, it's probably in the area of sleep that you've been quite negligent. Amen. And so I've been trying to focus on correcting my sleep. But there was also something that I did that I wasn't doing because I felt so lax. You know, it's summer, why do I have to do this hot and cold shower thing? That is, it's summer, you know? So I was, I was taught this by, uh, I listened to Med, Medgram. It's a wonderful series on, on YouTube. At the beginning of, of, of COVID, it said that the COVID, or uh, the coronavirus, puts your immune, your, your immune system to sleep. And the best way to, to wake it up is to do hot and cold showers. And the evidence that, that, that uh, the Dr. Swell gave was the experience of the sanitarium in 1918 pandemic, where he compared what was happening uh, in the equivalency of the, the great influenza of 1918, and he showed a comparison between what was happening in the 12 sanitariums that, have, that, 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 that the data was collected on on the East Coast and the army experience and there was a six-fold death rate among the army than those that were in the sanitarium. And so the principles that were pointed to were the eight natural laws in the sanitarium experience. And I implemented the eight natural laws as best as I could. The beautiful thing is, the, my wife and I got it at the same time. And we had to wrestle with it at the same time. But the lovely thing is, my son came back from Bible training school on the East Coast, and he had already gotten it before. And so he was able to minister to us the needs that we had. And we said, we need, we need this and need that. And our hot and cold showers, we put them back in place. By God's grace, we were able uh, to overcome those two weeks. It wasn't as severe as, as many other people have been experiencing. But there was also another layer, personally, that, that, I, that I was brought to, and saying, Rick, Ricky, you heard about these other um, Kirsten or uh, uh, hydrochloroquine and uh, ivermectin. And my family is in South Africa. And it's as difficult for them to get it there, if not more difficult than for me to get it over here. And I was impressed not to go that route, although I don't hold anybody, anybody who wants to take it, I don't hold it against you. The beautiful thing is that we were able to get through our bout with the coronavirus, and we found that indeed there was a way out for us. And we've been able to implement it to our neighbors, um, a 92-year-old who also got it, one of our neighbors, reached, we reached out to her and uh, after she was taken to the ER and she got monoclonal antibodies and she came back home and a friend of ours went over and did some hot and cold therapies on her. And so there's, there's, there wasn't only a, a benefit to us, but I'm convinced that the demonstration that Brother Ray was talking about, I truly believe that this is our opportunity to really implement what God has given to us. Amen. I am convinced that that is what my calling is, and I would be glad to answer anybody's questions about this. Um, 
and, and, uh, and I get, I get gain, gain any ideas from you. But I want to thank the Lord for the, this promise here in uh, Psalms 60, 67, that they may know, that thy way may be, may, may, may be known upon the earth, thy saving half among the nations. So God bless us all to, to be medical missionaries as, as Raymond was. And this is, I believe, God's final hour. And we're going to be trusting in Him from young Amen. Amen. Well, I knew Buffy before Ray, or at least before she was with Ray. And I was so privileged to get to be part of their lives through the years. <clears throat> I want to talk this afternoon about pillars, and you know, just listening to everybody else gives me so many thoughts and ideas. I really think our pillars of Adventism are the place where we go to find out who God really is. You know, there's so many ideas out there, and there's so many lies. And the devil's out there working so hard to give us a false view of God, right? And a false view of ourselves. But we can go to our pillars, and they tell us who God is and what truth is. And I'm only going to focus on a couple of them today because those two have been my focus. Um, our focus at LLT has been the Sabbath and the state of the dead. And we know that those are the two, um, those are the two pillars that Satan's worked the hardest to deceive people on at the end of time. I want to start just briefly with Genesis 32 and 33. You know that story, I won't read it all, but Moses had gone up into the mountain he was up there for a long time. He was up there for almost seven weeks. And the people heard not a word from him during that time. And they are getting restless. And they are wondering if he's even ever going to come down. And they've come out of paganism and out of slavery. And God has already been working to restore knowledge of the true God to them, right? He had already begun to teach them who he really was. But... Um, the mixed multitude among them were people who, who didn't have that heritage of God and maybe weren't as committed to learning it. And here they suggest, you know, let's make a God for ourselves. So they make that golden calf and Israel falls down and worships it and partakes in degrading rites. And God tells Moses, go down and see what these people are doing. Moses comes down the mountain and he's horrified and shocked and... And we know the story. We know that he chastised the people and they put it all away and, and many of them lost their lives over that. And then God told Moses, take the sanctuary and move it out of the camp. And he moved the sanctuary out of the camp and he went into that sanctuary and, and God came down in the cloud to talk to him. And Moses is talking to God. Sorry, did I say Genesis, Exodus? And God is talking to God, and he's, Moses is talking to God, and he's, he says, show me the way. Show me the way that I need to take, and uh, help me find grace in your sight, so that I know how to lead this people. And God says to Moses in uh, Exodus 33, verse 14, he says, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. And how many of us need rest? We live in a world where everybody needs rest. And God has provided that rest. He said, I will give you rest. And he says it all the way through scripture. Go with me to Hebrews. What is the rest? You know, what is the rest that God has called us to and that he's giving us? You know, all know Hebrews 4. We go into the verses, uh, verse 9, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest has also ceased from his own works, as God did from his at creation. So let's labor, therefore, to enter into that rest 
lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So that rest has to do with putting aside our own works and our own unbelief. You know, rest first happened there in Genesis 2. God, God made the seventh day a day of rest in, in memory of his great creative power. He stopped his work and he said, come and we'll rest. And it was a day of rest dedicated. Then God made the Sabbath a day of rest for Israel. And in Deuteronomy chapter 5, he shows us that it's a day of rest from bondage as well. That's verse 13 and 14 in there. So he said, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy ox, nor thy ass, nor thy stranger, or the senior gates, or your maidservant. And remember then that you were a servant in, in the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought you out of there through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord commanded that you keep this Sabbath day holy. So Sabbath then was a memorial of freedom from bondage. How many of us need freedom from bondage? Freedom from the slavery of sin. Sabbath was a symbol of the freedom from slavery. You know, mistakenly sometimes I think Adventists haven't really shared the Sabbath in its fullness. When we invite people to keep the Sabbath as the fourth commandment, we're missing a large part of what the Sabbath is. Yes, it's the fourth commandment. God has asked us to do it, but he's asked us to do it as a reminder of the fact that he is our deliverer. He's our savior. He brings us into his rest so that we no longer strive to do our own works for salvation. I visit the country of Turkey fairly regularly because I have children who live there and grandchildren. And Turkey is 99% Muslim. And the people of Turkey know nothing of this kind of rest. In Islam, your your salvation is based on how, how much better your good works are than your bad works. And there are many, many rules to follow and there are many rituals to do. And if you don't successfully worship five times a day at the prayer call, then you need to be sure that you keep the 30 days of Ramadan very carefully. And if you very carefully don't eat all day long during Ramadan for 30 days, you could feast all night, that's okay. But all these rituals are what you do in order to obtain salvation. And nobody ever knows if they've done it well enough or if they're good enough. We know, right? We know that our works are never good enough. We have never ever done enough good works to merit salvation. But the people of Islam don't know that. And they have to guess all the time about whether they're doing enough that weighs heavier on the scales of good than the bad that they do. Can you imagine that kind of life? Jesus has called us to rest from that. He's called us to know that we can never perform enough good works to be worthy of salvation. And that our very best is filthy rags. And that we are completely dependent on the sacrifice of Christ. And that we can rest in that sacrifice. We can have peace. We can have rest. We can be in that boat in the storm and believe that Jesus will save us. You know, I love that story and I appreciated it hearing it this morning. You know, the disciples are out there in that boat and they literally are dying. The boat is filling with water and they're bailing and they can't bail fast enough and they can't bail enough to save themselves and they know they're dying. And they call out to Jesus who's soundly sleeping in the midst of it all. And he wakes up and he's, I believe to me, it's peaceful, peace, be still. And then he says, why are you afraid? <clears throat> Just think about it. Would you have been afraid? Have I ever been afraid of anything? Do I ever need to be afraid of anything? Jesus is calling us to complete rest. He's calling us to never a moment of fear. To know every moment that we're in his hands. And that he loves us with an everlasting love. And that he took our place 
in death so that we can have life. We never need to have a moment's fear. And that's what the Sabbath is about. Sabbath is a reminder that we rest our souls completely in Him. And not just for the boat ride today, but for eternity. I can rest my soul for salvation in Him. I can know for surety that I'm saved in Jesus Christ. I can rest my children's salvation in Him. That's a little harder, right? I'm not telling you that it's easy. <laughs> I'm telling you that we go to these promises over and over again. And we're lifted. And we find strength and we find life. Right? You know, there's that verse in Isaiah 50. Someone quoted Isaiah 50 today. And there's a verse in there that I, that I love and I go to over and over again. It's Isaiah 50, verse 10. It says, Who's among you that fears the Lord? That's like grace, that kind of fear. That obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness, darkness and has no light. When I first read this, I thought, why would anyone who obeys the voice of God's servant be walking in darkness? I thought, we're always walking in the light if we're following God, right? But it goes on to say, let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. That means support yourself on his God. And I came across a passage from M. L. Andreessen in his book on Isaiah where he explained that passage and he said dark times come to everybody. Look at Jesus in the garden. Three times he begged God, let this cup pass if it could be your will. And did the cup pass? No. No. God let him go through it. It was a dark time for Jesus. Andreessen goes on to say, every one of us has dark times like that. And we need those dark times because we don't develop trust and faith in God when things are easy. You know, we think we have faith when everything's fine, right? We don't even know that we don't have faith until we come into really difficult circumstances. And then we find that God is faithful. And then we get faith, right? Because we don't know how faithful God is until we need Him desperately. And so God in His mercy and goodness allows us to be in great need. And then we find these promises, and we find that we can rest our souls in Him. And we can have the Sabbath experience every day. Sabbath isn't just for Sabbath. We, we stop our physical labors on Sabbath as a reminder. But every day of the week, when we're still doing our, our work and our school and our whatever we have been called to do, we rest our souls in God. Just the same, right? Because we know that He's faithful and that He has already saved us and that He's willing to put His mind in our minds and let us have His thoughts and let us speak His words. He's willing to make us His hands and His feet on this earth. Isn't that amazing? Don't you think it's amazing that the God of the universe chose to show the universe what he's like in you and me, in weak humanity. The universe is watching us. And the great controversy is all about if God is really who he says he is. The devil says that God is not who he says he is. And the devil says that God has requires of us some, required of us something that we can't do. And God says he is good, and he does empower us, and he can accomplish his work in us. And here he chooses us in all of our weakness, in all of our failings, in all of our, sadly, lack of trust in him to show the universe that he is powerful and mighty and loving. And when I think of it that way, you know, I hear people dreading the time of trouble. It's going to be hard times for us. But I think if God can use me to show all of them out there that he's mighty enough to hold me up. Amen. Then more power to him. Amen. Let him do it in us. Let him have us. Amen. Let him use us. Let him speak through our mouths and give us thoughts and walk through our feet. And let him empower us to be like Jesus on this earth when everything is anti-Christ and anti-Jesus. That's what the Sabbath is about. It's the proof 
that God is who He is and that He can make us who He wants us to be. Amen. I love the Sabbath, don't you? I wonder how people survive without it. How do people make it through the heavy burdens of their lives without being able to rest? Life is too heavy of a burden for me. And the other area that we've focused on is the area of what happens at death. You realize that every major religion believed the first lie from Eden. Wow. You know, God had told him, if you eat of this tree, if you disobey, you'll surely die. Amen. The serpent came to Eve and he said, so what did God say? Taking the lesson was so good this morning about it. Did God say you can't eat this tree? And she said, well, we can eat of all the trees in the garden. Just this one we can't eat of, and we can't even touch it. She kind of added to what God said, which is a whole other lesson in itself, right? And the devil contradicted her. You will not surely die. And that lie has circled the globe ever since. And the majority of people in this world, in all the major religions, and the minor religions, even Christianity, believe that lie. But, you know, we actually do believe in life after death, right? Mm -hmm. Because First Thessalonians tells us what kind of life that will be. It comes from the resurrection. But that lie has distorted the character of God. You know, what do you think of a God who will throw you into fire for eternity if you don't choose to be with him in eternity? How could you trust a God like that? Who's telling you? I mean, I honestly think that people who believe that lie don't really think about it. Amen. I mean, if you think about God maintaining breath in you while he keeps you under the flames forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, we can't quantify forever. It's unimaginable that a God who says he's love would burn anybody. We wouldn't do that to our worst enemy. And I'm not near as loving as God. We couldn't do that to each other. How could we believe that God could do that to somebody? Amen. To a child, to a person that he loves. You know, he loves us even if we're not walking with him. He sent his spirit to woo every one of us and draw us to him because he doesn't want to lose any. He say in 1 Peter 3, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's my God. He doesn't want to lose anyone. But how many people on this earth believe that about him? They believe that in Islam. And many people in Judaism believe that as well. And of course, many people in Christianity. So we have to set the record straight about what happens at death. The truth is, the truth is really a comfort, isn't it? Yeah. The truth that we go to sleep. Remember Jesus is talking to his disciples about Lazarus. We're going to go see Lazarus now. He slept less. He's gone to sleep. and the, He's gone to sleep and the disciples are like, oh good, that means his fever broke. Probably he's feeling a lot better. And Jesus said, I mean death. Lazarus is dead. That's the kind of sleep that death is for Jesus. You don't know anything. You don't feel anything. When you wake up, it's just like you just went to sleep. What a mercy. That's an act of love, right? How many of you have lost people you love? Isn't it a great comfort that they're not looking down on you from heaven, observing your grief, and having to watch you struggle and make mistakes and have hard times and grieve? I thank God every day that my husband and sons are not watching me. How could their life in heaven be blissful if they had to watch our sad times down here. God is merciful. He doesn't make him do that. He lets him sleep. Hebrews, I love the last verse there in Hebrews 40, Hebrews 11, chapter, uh, verse 49, where it says, they're waiting for us. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. God, having provided something better, for us that they without us should not be made perfect. They're waiting for us. And we have a message about God to share with the world when we teach people what really happens at death. We have a message about a God who really truly is love and whose heart of mercy is with our hearts. 
You know, he grieves when we grieve. When I lost my husband and sons, I had such a sense. I mean, I was thinking, you know, does God know? Does he see us down here? I had two children left and we're all in a huddle and wondering, does God know? And there was such a sense that flooded over me that God knows. And God cares. And our grief is his grief. Our loss is his loss. He, too, doesn't get to be with our loved ones until he raises them from the dead. He suffers all of that with us. He's our God. He's our Savior.